Thanks, Christopher. And hi, everyone. More officially, um, we're a relatively small group, which I think is nice. It's going to make perhaps for a bit more dynamism during our discussion if we're not 100 people. Um, and just to piggyback on what Christopher mentioned, um, so the idea is at the end of the talks, we'll essentially promote everyone uh, in the attendees list to panelists so that we can kind of function a bit more like a meeting rather than a webinar. You can raise hands, you can unmute yourself, and so on. And, and we'll try to have a bit more of a discussion. We can go back to certain talks that had more questions. We've got some ideas for food for thought to um, point out, throw out to you guys and to discuss amongst the speakers. So that's the idea there. Um, and also just uh, hi, everyone. Also to introduce myself, uh, my name is Jilda Cacavo. I am speaking to you from uh, bright and early 5 a.m. in Paris, France. Um, and uh, I'm excited to get this session started. Um, and we're leading off with Nicole Hill today. So Nicole, you can have the floor. Uh, thanks, Judah. <clears throat> and just sharing my screen. So yeah, thanks, Judah and Chris. So um, I'm coming to you from uh, the University of Tasmania, Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies in Hobart, Australia. Um, and what I'm going to be talking to you about today um, is a project where we're uh, collaborating with um, fisheries and uh, the management of Australian Man Fisheries Management Authority to understand a little bit more about um, what's happening on the uh, Kirkland Plateau, in particular around Herder McDonald Islands um, and in relation to the Patagonian two fish fishery. Um, it's also um, work involving the Australian Antarctic Division. And there we go. There's a bit of a, a lag. So this is focused on the Kirkland Plateau, which I probably don't need to um, introduce too much to, to the audience here. Uh, the Kirkland Plateau is in the Southern Indian Ocean, pretty much smack bang in the middle of nowhere, rises sharply out of um, abyssal depths. Um, it has a complex oceanography because of this. Um, it has nutrient rich waters, which support a highly productive um, region and foraging areas for birds and mammals, as well as a significant um, two fish and ice fish fishery. It's in terms of its management, the northern part of the plateau is a French territory, uh, French EEZ, and the southern part of the plateau here is an Australian um, EEZ. And um, there's been both a terrestrial and a um, marine reserve declared in the region to, in recognition of its ecological significance. But moving right along to the two fish fishery. So the two fish fishery uh, is a Patagonian two fish. It's of high, um, high value fishery. Um, there are just two operators in the Australian region. Um, in the early days from the 1990s to the early 2000s, and there was a lot of um, illegal and unregulated fishing, which was stamped out in about 2004. Um, a legal trawl fishery began in the region in 1997. Um, and then in 2003, so what this graph here shows is um, the number of hauls that are trawls in green and uh, long line in blue. From 2003, the fishery started to transition from being um, long line, I mean, so trawl dominated to uh, long line dominated and is now pretty much exclusively long line for two fish. Um, it's a highly managed fishery. So even though it's within the Australian um, EEZ, it's actually managed um, in accordance with Camelar principles and um, stock assessments go through the Camelar process. It's also um, a fishery where the industry is, is very engaged and they actively invest in the science that underpin the sustainable management and conservation of, of this fishery, which is, which is excellent. Um, so the motivation for this work was in 2016, the industry recorded a sharp decline in two fish catch rates. And this in coincided with an intense surface heat wave across the plateau. And this figure here just shows um, the sea surface temperature anomaly over the plateau in August of 2016. So this was a sort of sustained heat wave that persisted in well into the winter months. And we can see that there's um, high higher temperatures in the southern part of the plateau, um, higher than normal winter temperatures. So this um, led the industry to have, and management to have several um, burning questions about this. And uh, in collaboration with them, we developed a um, broader project that was looking at asking questions such as, well, how anomalous was the heat wave in 2016? Where does it sit in the um, climatology of um, the environmental conditions on the plateau? Um, 
how can the surface conditions affect a deep water fishery? So what are some of the mechanistic understandings of what's going on in the fishery um, and its interactions with the environment and other parts of the ecosystem, some of which we don't have good knowledge for. So we um, developed some qualitative network models here. The part that I'm gonna focus on today in, is there a relationship between surface temperatures or other environmental factors and catch rates? Um, and in the context of climate change, given that heat waves and uh, are predicted to be more um, frequent and intense, and given what's happening in other fisheries in the world, what does this mean for this particular two fish fishery and its management? But as I said, I'm focusing mostly on this part today. So the aim was to try to quantify the relationship between environmental conditions and catch rates through time. And the way that we've gone about this is using generalised additive models using the Hall level data and monthly environmental data. And we've used GAMS because they can model nonlinearity and also because they're used, um, they, they're the basis for the standardised CPUE models that are used to understand some of the fisheries dynamics um, to help uh, with the stock assessment models. So we've got about 13,000 hauls from 2003 to 2021. And um, we also have scientific data for the region and I've looked at that, but what I'm gonna be presenting to you today is um, catch per unit effort for the commercial uh, long line hauls. So um, based on discussions with stakeholders, reviewing the literature and some preliminary um, cross-correlation analysis, we had a whole bunch of environmental variables that might be um, influential in uh, affecting catch rates through time. So obviously some, some, some static ones to do with the depth and uh, topography of the Kerguelen Plateau, in particular the Round Herd and McDonald Islands, um, some climate indices, the uh, Indian Ocean Diapole and Southern Annular Mode, information that we can get from satellite. So we can get that kind of information near real time and fairly easily, but it only measures surface conditions um, and information from an oceanographic um, model. So the Blue Link reanalysis product, which is, um, as the name suggests, constrained by historical um, observations. And the advantage of this is that it can get, um, you know, bottom currents, bottom conditions. And we had a whole bunch of model sets that we considered. So the base model is essentially the CPUE standardization model. It includes depth, year, months, that long, and um, vessel as a random factor. Then we considered what's happening, um, can, what we can view in the satellite that's happening at the same time as the, when they're fishing. So this also included um, slope and moon phase, plus the climate indices, plus sea surface temperature and height and their anomalies. Um, and then we did essentially a bit of a trawl saying, well, you know, given all the time lags that we have and that could be re related to um, what's going on currently, um, we use random forest to identify the 10 most uh, important predictive variables, uncorrelated predictive variables and put them into to the GAM. Um, and then we did the same with the uh, oceanographic model. And here we could start to include some of the bottom conditions or the modeled model conditions as well. And similarly looked for um, the model that had uh, the best lags as identified by random forest. Um, and technically we modeled catch with the Tweedy distribution and log effort offset, if anyone was, is interested in that detail. Um, so how did our models do? So in terms of explanatory power, um, the amount of variance that they could explain, all the models explained roughly 40% of the variance and um, the amount of variance they explained was quite similar. In terms of um, the most parsimonious model, so the model that explains the most amount of variation with the least number of predictors, which is what this AIC is, um, that came up as the contemporary conditions from the satellite model um, and also the best lags from, from the the blue link reanalysis model, noting that this the blue link reanalysis only goes to the end of 2019. Um, and we also considered predictive power. So we were looking at how well can we use this model to predict to use that we haven't seen. And we assess this using Pearson's um, correlation. So all of the models again did um, fairly similarly. Um, in this case, the base model came out best and um, the blue link reanalysis model with the lags came out best. 
what does this look like um, when we look at the time series? So how well do the models that we've developed recreate the time series? Um, what we've got here is the blue dot here is, is the observed raw time series, um, catch per unit effort, um, and overlaid on that, the mean predictions of each of the models. And you can see that essentially, which is probably no surprise given the statistics I just showed in the slide before, they all do um, fairly well and, and produce relatively similar, similar predictions. And then if we look to what is the response um, to the environmental factors that we've put into these models. Um, these are conditional plots. So um, sort of the magnitude indicate is, a, is an indication of um, relative importance um, and the shape um, obviously gives an indication of the shape of the response to that particular factor. So there were some commonalities and this is what we're looking for in terms of shape. We were looking at commonalities amongst some of the models. Um, we can see that here we've got um, a strong relationship with depth and with year and this is relationship with year initially is decreasing but it starts to trend up again after about 2017. Um, we can see some response with the climate indices, uh, a bit of a weak positive response with IOD um, and sort of a quadratic response with SAM, so neutral being um, less CPUE than either positive or negative SAM. Um, and then some of what we were interested in, which was that um, relationship with the anomaly, sea surface anomaly, we didn't actually get a negative trend like we, we might have been expecting. And if we look at the what happens when we consider lag conditions, again, we get sort of strong responses with depth and year. Um, but we also start to get some slightly different responses if we're looking at um, lagged sea surface temperature anomaly. We start to get a slightly negative response if we're looking over the past three months and a sort of quadratic response um, if we're looking at anomalies lagged between two, one and two years. So a really quick summary and conclusions from, from this work so far is that we've um, been able to build GAM models that are able to catch the mean trend and do a reasonable job at predicting to unseen years. Um, we're not getting an exceptionally strong signal with SST or anomalies. What, what we're tending to see is that contemporary anomaly um, might be relatively flat or positively correlated with CPUE. Um, we start to get a negative or different response if we look at lags um, from three months up to, uh, to, to four years, uh, two to four years. Um, there's probably some local spatiotemporal variation that's still not well captured by the changing environmental conditions that we've got in the model. And um, we've got depth, time and location are still quite influential variables. Although despite this, um, some of the work we've shown, we've done has shown that the models have some short, may have some short-term predictive capacity. Also that there's an uptrend in the CPUE in recent years that indicates that the observations in 2016 were, were not due to a decline in stock biomass because they've come back up um, relatively quickly. And at the moment, we're in the process of combining the information that we're getting from these models with the outcomes of the other work packages to provide a more sort of comprehensive and integrated message for what this might mean for management. Um, and we're also generating a shiny app for industry managers to explore um, the spatial results for themselves. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was super cool. We're at 11 minutes, so I'm only going to ask one super <laughs> quick question. No worries. We are flexible with timing today. Um, so I'm tangentially working with some folks at AVI, the Alfred Wegener Institute, that are trying to do a similar type of distribution model based on CPUE in the Weddell Sea and environmental mm -hmm. variables. Are you, do you guys know each other? Because I feel like you guys need to know each other. Um, I've heard about, heard about, this? Uh, I've heard about some of you? the work in relation to the um, Weddell Sea Phase 2 MPA work. Because they're doing almost exactly this. They're basing mm -hmm. a lot of their work on a 2017 FSA paper um, yep. that looked at spatial variation. Um, so in any event, I might 
I might try to function as matchmaker here because I think that um, it would be, I mean, to be fair, there are some differences obviously between what you might consider in Kerguelen and in the Weddell Sea with regard and also Patagonian versus Antarctic toothfish. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, this this could be really fertile ground for cross -fertil fertilization. So yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Thank you. Um, what I, what I would say for everybody else, if anyone else has questions, and I have even more questions, but I'll hold off on them for now, you can either put them into the Q&A box, as the IT team mentioned, um, or you can save them for the discussion portion of um, the session. And Nicole, you can respond to those questions uh, via text directly in the Q&A box if folks have those. Um, so in the meantime, um, we'll move on to our next speaker, which is actually a pre-recorded um, talk. Um, it's Francisco uh, Santa Cruz. And if the Scar IT team would be kind enough to play his talk now, that would be great. Are you guys pulling up the talk? I'll write to them as well. I'm not playing them well. Okay, perfect. Got it. Thank you so much. I'll be quiet. Hello everyone, my name is Francisco Santa Cruz. I'm going to present you the work space channel temporal catch concentrations for, for Antarctic krill, implications for fishing performance and precautionary management in the southern ocean. This is a work uh, from between uh, colleagues from the Chilean Antarctic Institute. As you know, the Antarctic krill, Eupausia superba, is one of the most abundant species in the ocean, in the southern ocean. Uh, Antarctic krill plays a key role in the Antarctic food web. For aside, uh, is an important food supply for marine mammals, birds, and fishes, and also contribute uh, to move large amount of atmospheric carbon into the deep ocean. The Antarctic krill uh, is an important fishing resource uh, exploited by the largest fishery in the Southern Ocean. Uh, most of the catches uh, since the 19s occurs uh, in the South Atlantic area of the Southern Ocean, in the area 48. Uh, mostly in the Western Antarctic Peninsula, the South Ornick Island and the South Georgia Island. All the fishing activities for Antarctic krill uh, are managed by Camelar using both precautionary and ecosystem-based approaches in order to minimize the risk for the ecosystem. Um, there is a fixed seasonal catch limit known uh, the trigger level which is proportionally allocated among the sub-areas in order to avoid catches concentration. There is a common assumption that the, these precautionary measures and the high estimate for, of, of krill biomass uh, implies that there is a low impact of the fishery on the ecosystem. However, the recent fast uh, environmental changes that we are noticed in the Antarctic Peninsula, which includes the ocean warming and an important decrease in, in the sea ice coverage, uh, are factors that can impact tree productivity and this is spatial distribution. And thus uh, are imposing new challenges for the true fishery management for Camelar. Uh, also, there is some concerns about how precautionary is the current management for these species under the this uh, environmental modification and the projected 
change uh, in, the Antarctic, in the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, in addition to this, uh, we also know that the krill fishery is an extremely aggregative activity, which use every season the same well-defined fishing hotspot. So we are working on evaluating the hypothesis that the increase of the seasonal catches and the persistent behavior of the, the persistent spatial and temporal concentration could determine localized deflation and could even impact uh, on the fishing performance in itself. To test this hypothesis, uh, we use 38 years of catch and effort data to evaluate the fishing per performance over time, and we investigate potential impacts of the spatial and temporal concentration on the krill CPUE. Uh, we use the CPUE expressed like a ton per hour, like an indicator of the fishing performance. And we calcul calculate CPUE at whole level. And then we estimate a mean CPUE per day, per chip, and we calculate among the different small scale management units in the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, we know that the CPUE is a sensible indicator uh, which varies uh, depending on historical ch change in the fleet composition or the spatial distribution of the catches or seasonal variability within the season. So in order to reduce this variability, we and, and and estimate and the, or, or identify the general trend of the CPUE. We use uh, GAM models to standardize CPUE. And in order to identify a factor, factors that could impact the CPUE trend in time, we calculate uh, two uh, indicator of fishing concentration one related to catch per area and other catch per day. And also we estimate the CIS coverage uh, in each SSMU. Among the main results, um, we identified that the CIS cover has tended to remain stable among the uh, studied sector, except for Elephant Island and Drake Passage, which has a decreased trend in time. Uh, we also identified uh, uh, that the fishing concentration has developed an increasing pattern, both in terms of spatial uh, concentration and in, in temporal concentration. In general, the standardized CPUE uh, showed a, a decreased trend uh, in all uh, the evaluated sectors. We also uh, identify a positive uh, relationship between the standardized CPUE and the CIS cover. In general, the standard CPUE was higher as increased CIS cover. And uh, we notice an inverse relationship between the standard CPUE and the spatial and temporal fishing concentration. In other words, as fishing concentration increases, the standard cool CPUE has decreased in China. Our results uh, confirm the highly concentrated behavior of the cruel fishery. The general pattern is that trawlers persistently operate in the small and well delineated fishing hotspot, which recently have sustained the highest uh, catches and during shorter fishing season, which is resulting in the highest spatial and temporal fishing concentration in four decades. Uh, the fishing performance has responded negatively to the increases in spatial and temporal concentration. 
to us, this is a concern, especially for areas uh, in areas with decreasing trends of the CBOE, which are very important for predators and for foraging during its foraging activities. We also I think that it's very important to extend this, this spatial coverage of acoustic surveys and its periodicity to those critical areas, especially, for example, the Gerlach Strait, either by independent regular transects or doing or using the fishing vessel as platforms. Um, in particular, uh, the Gerlach Strait has had a higher level of, of, of spatial and temporal fishing concentration uh, during the last decade and is one of the less monitored area. So we think we potentially are fishing blind with unknown impacts on the ecosystem. Uh, and in, it's a situation which may be highly unprecautionary. unprecautionary. Of course, we also noticed that there is different source of uncertainty uh, around the CPUE estimates and trends. Uh, there is some factor that could impact the CPU, the CPU estimation, like the krill flux or the krill reduction by predation by cetaceans. Uh, that are two factors that can reduce the local krill availability. However, we believe that CPUE is a valuable piece of information that should be used in complement with other information from surface to inform responses of local twin abundance and its availability among the different fishing areas. I would like to thank the Marine Protected Area Program of the Chilean Antarctic Institute. And we appreciate any comments, observations, or doubts. Uh, please contact us. So thank you very much for your attention. So you're all in luck this morning or evening um, because you got to see a PM session talk. That was actually scheduled. Uh, that Francisco actually had two talks um, and that was his Krill talk, which we originally put into the Krill block that we had uh, in the PM session. But um, so you're all very lucky and Francisco's lucky to have his talk shown twice. We will show Francisco's fish talk that was actually scheduled to be just now at the end of the talks. And just as a reminder, um, I'm putting Francisco's email into the chat. If you have any questions about his work, please feel free to contact him directly via email. Um, so moving along, um, I hand it over to Christopher because he will introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Jilda. And I would like to now introduce uh, my esteemed co-convener. She's stepping out of her convening role at the moment, make no mistake. And she's going to be uh, speaking to her, um, her presentation, The Climate Genomics of Antarctic Toothfish. So, Jilda. Thank you, Christopher. We're a proper uh, Cher and Bono. Um, okay, so... Um... Let me get my sharing up and start the presentation. Okay, I presume that everything looks good. If not, someone just holler. So um, everything looks good. Thank you so much, Christopher. So uh, as uh, you know before, uh, because I'm also convening. Uh, my name is Jilda Kakavo. What I didn't mention um, is that I'm affiliated with a couple of different institutes here in Paris. Um, so there's this entity called the Institut Pierre-Simon Laplace, and that's essentially an umbrella institute of a bunch of different climate institutes in and around Paris. And I'm affiliated with two of those climate institutes, one related to environmental science and one related to oceanography, as well as having an affiliation with this genetics institute. Um, here in the Paris area. And so with the support from IPSL, I am bringing you the exciting work that I'm just starting to carry out here, 
which I've titled Climate Genomics of Antarctic Toothfish. So I'll start by discussing what exactly I mean by this term climate genomics. So I'm gonna zoom out a bit to provide a context for what I mean. So you can think of one of the goals of scientists at this interface between the climate sciences and ecology um, as wanting to address what critical reciprocal gaps exist in the climate sciences and in ecology. And so this leads to questions like, how do we integrate environmental data and predictions from the geosciences into ecological models of biodiversity? And conversely, how do we integrate biodiversity data into climate science models of environmental change? So the gaps between these two disciplines have led to the following problem. Biodiversity is not well represented in models predicting the impact of climate change on ecosystem services. And until now, essentially, you can think about the study of impacts of climate change on ecosystem services having been carried out in sort of two different overall ways, if we want to really oversimplify things, and especially amongst an audience of biologists, I'm allowed to say this. So we can think of these approaches as indirect and direct. So the indirect approach is largely we can think of being carried out by geoscientists who use physical measures in order to model climate scenarios. The direct approach has been carried out by ecologists who use life history and environmental associations in order to model species distributions. In recent years, this direct approach has been enhanced by genomics. And so geneticists have begun to use genomic variation in order to create genome environment associations and genetically informed species distribution models. But what has been missing from these approaches is crosstalk. So climate projections lack data on the extent to which biodiversity sustains key environmental processes and ecological predictions and genome environment associations require better environmental data from earth system models. So that's where the field that I've dubbed climate genomics sits. It's at this critical interface between geoscience and ecological approaches aiming to bridge these gaps in our capacity to predict climate change impacts on ecosystem services. So, that was just a brief introduction to give you an idea of what I mean by climate genomics generally. And so now I'm going to zoom back in to the Southern Ocean and talk to you about how I intend to apply these climate genomics methods in Antarctic toothfish, Desosticus mossini. So I'm speaking a little bit to the crowd because we're a lot of fisheries people, but just in case someone else has straggled in, I'll provide a brief introduction to Antarctic toothfish. So, they belong to the Antarctic fish clade Cryonotothenioidae, as you can see here on the left. They're part of the suborder Notothenioidae, and they're some of the largest of the Antarctic fish, reaching up to one to two meters in length. They have a circumpolar distribution. You can find them inhabiting shelf areas, as shown here in orange, as well as slope areas and offshore seamounts, all south of the Antarctic circumpolar current. Finally, Antarctic toothfish are also important, an important top predator. Um, they're important also as a prey species for whales and seals. So they have this important ecological role in the Southern Ocean as well. And in addition to their role in the Southern Ocean ecosystem, they have a role in our world in supporting a very lucrative fishery. So their fishery has been noted to be worth over 500 million US dollars annually. This chart here shows the increase in legal toothfish catch starting from the late 1990s through to the late 2000s, um, starting from the start of the fishery through to the late 2000s. And you can see this marked increase at the, at the start of the 2000s. And if you remember back to Nicole's talk, she actually gave us even more of a context for, for how the fishery for toothfish, both Antarctic and Patagonian has evolved. And so we see that these levels in toothfish catch um, have leveled off, so to speak, in the past 20 years or so. And despite this leveling off, though, there is increasing interest in fishing for toothfish generally and Antarctic toothfish in particular. And so the blue circles on this chart here actually show areas where there is an increased interest in Antarctic toothfish. And of course, as many of you know, Antarctic, the fishery for Antarctic toothfish is largely managed by CAMLAR or the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. 
Um, and while Kamlar is doing its best to manage the fishery, considering fisheries interests and ecosystem impacts and trying to balance these two ends of, of the stick, so to speak, um, a critical major gap in the management of Antarctic toothfish is what impact climate change will have on their life history and their distribution. And why would that be, for example? I'll tell you why, <laughs> or at least why I hypothesize that that might be the case. So early life stages of toothfish are strongly associated with sea ice. Um, toothfish life history depends on circulation patterns to transport fish from nursery areas on offshore seamounts to, developmental er to development areas in shallower shelf waters. So then the goal of my research is to use genotype environment association or GEA as is the acronym and genetically informed species distribution models or GSDM. I mentioned these two earlier in the climate genomics intro in a context of also circulation modeling to test hypotheses related to climate change impacts on Antarctic toothfish. So in this map of Antarctica, the pink quadrants correspond to fisheries management zones by Kamlar, and the red and blue shaded areas represent regions undergoing warming versus cooling trends, respectively. And so my first question of this research project is what is the impact of climate change on the Antarctic toothfish genome? And in order to answer that question, the first hypothesis I'll test is whether Antarctic toothfish populations are experiencing greater environment, I'm sorry, rather, populations that are experiencing greater environmental shifts due to climate change, will they exhibit stronger signatures of local adaptation in their genome? So then my second question will be, how will climate change impact Antarctic toothfish distribution and connectivity? So in order to answer the second question, the second hypothesis I aim to test is whether Antarctic toothfish distributions will start to rely more heavily on spawning grounds that have more consistent icy ice cover and that are associated with less variable circulation pathways. And as I mentioned before, there are certain circulation pathways that are critical to tooth, that we hypothesize are critical to toothfish life history. And so related to the second hypothesis, I will also test whether shifts in Antarctic toothfish population distributions will contribute to a decrease in potential connectivity between populations, which will ultimately result in greater population structuring, i.e. greater isolation of populations, which will ultimately re result in a reduced resilience of populations experiencing greater impacts of climate change. And so the deliverables of this re research are intended to inform precautionary management of the fishery for toothfish, considering the impacts of climate change. But even more importantly than this, this study is an Antarctic toothfish, and I'm speaking to the choir. We actually all really care about Antarctic toothfish here. But if I was talking to a bunch of non-Southern Ocean people, I would even argue that the point of this study goes above and beyond toothfish and even the Southern Ocean. And it's this idea of creating this, these types of models of studies using genomics to predict climate change impacts on species in any, in any ecosystem, and also thinking about applying these types of approaches to multiple key species within an ecosystem to get a sort of ecosystem picture of climate change impact predictions. So with that, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen. I want to thank my collaborators on this project who are Marion Guillen, um, who's at the Environmental Science Climate Laboratory of IPSL, Francisco De Vidio, who's at the Oceanographic IPSL Laboratory, and Olivier Géon and Paul Fremont, who are both at the Genomics Institute I told you about, Genoscope. So given time constraints, I was only able to go into so much detail on everything, so I'm happy to discuss this further either via email or in the discussion portion of this session. Um, and of course, uh, my email's there and my website has been on every slide. So. Uh, thank you very much, um, and I will stop my share and pass things over to Christopher. All right, thank you very much for that, Jilda. Um, yeah, as, as Jilda mentioned, um, if you if you could um, go ahead and uh, and you know put together any questions you might have on this presentation, and we could pick that up at the end of the session um, a little bit later. Um, so let's see. Right right now, we'll uh, we'll move on. Um, so 
Jilda, perhaps I'll pass it back to you for our next speaker. Yes, yeah, so, sorry guys, we have a whole system. So I'm in charge we of you, Joel. System, so please. I'm in introducing you. Um, Joel Williams is gonna be talking to us next. Um, and Joel, you have the floor. No worries, thank you. Okay, I'll find the right screen to share. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, my name's Joel Williams. I'm a, a researcher at IMAS at the University of Tasmania, and today I'm going to talk to you about changes in the fish community structure uh, on the Kerglin Plateau. Sorry, this slide's not moving forward. Yeah, we're still seeing it on the same slide. Okay, perfect. Yep. Okay, there we go. Um, so th thankfully, we've had a bit of an introduction to the Southern Ocean and, and thanks to Nicole, who's introduced the Kerguelen Plateau, but just to put a bit of context into, into my presentation, the Kerguelen Plateau, as we know, is a large geographical feature in the Southern Ocean. It's an area of conservation significance that's managed under the CAMLA principles based on ecosystem-based management approach. And as we probably all know, it's an area of um, high climate change risk with water, rising water temperatures, shifting polar fronts, changing water chemistry, and we're expecting to see shifting uh, species ranges. But little is known about how, if and how, the fish community is changing in structure and, and distribution. So Australia has a EEZ uh, in the middle of the, the plateau and it's based around the Heard Island, Heard and McDonald Islands, also known as Hemi. That's been recognised by uh, was through World Heritage listing in 1997. Uh, a no-take marine reserve was implemented in 2002. The area is known to um, support a number of endemic species. Uh, there's, as we've heard in this, in the last couple of talks, there's some um, significant fisheries, including the Patagonian and mackerel ice fish. But um, as we also heard through the last couple of talks, most, most, most research is based around single species research. And there's um, quite a large knowledge gap about the how the community, the fish community is structured across the, the, the plateau and how this has changed through time. So this leads to my research question, that is, has the benthic fish community of the Hemi region changed in the last two decades? And can this change be related to environmental factors, fishing pressures or management? So to examine this, we used existing data that was collected through a random stratified trawl survey program that's managed by the Australian Antarctic Division. Uh, it started in 1990, it runs annually, it uses the same methods, so same nets, tow distances, so that it allows into annual com com comparisons. It's based on a random stratified sampling design. Uh, it's primarily designed to survey Patagonian toothfish and mackerel ice fish. However, there's data on, on all species. So to analyse this large, very large data set, uh, we decided to take a joint species distribution modelling approach. Uh, more specifically, we, we used um, hierarchical modelling of species community, which I won't go into too much detail because it's quite, it can be quite complex, but if you've got any questions, please feel free to send me an email or ask a question in the chat. But in general statistical terms, um, HMSC is based on a multivariate hierarchical generalized linear mixed model fitted with Bayesian inference. And we use the RSTS data, um, converted the abundances to CPU. Um, we focused on the years 2003 to 2016 because that's where we had the greatest amount of um, reliable environmental data and oceanographic modeling. And we used a suite of environmental variables that we thought could explain change in, in fish prevalence and distribution, including um, bathymetric um, metrics, um, satellite derived oceanographic models um, and climate metrics such as SAM, IOD um, and uh, sea surface height. And then we included a, a bunch of random factors, including a spatial random factor, strata, and, and a temporal random factor. We fitted this as a hurdle model to deal with some of the super rare species that occur in the data. So there's two models, there's a presence absent model and an abundance conditional on presence model. So here's a quick map of um, the distribution of the trawls this is just basically demonstrating the amazing spatial and temporal coverage. The different colours represent different years. Um, so getting fantastic coverage inside and outside the marine reserve across the, the top of the plateau in the Australian EEZ. 
So the, the HMSC pumps out a lot of information, um, too much information to present in eight, eight minutes, but I'll demonstrate what we can do and some of the take-home messages that this, this model has been showing us. So here we have um, two plots for the presence absence model represented by the red box. On the left here, we have the amount of variance that's explained by the model. So these are all the species that were included in the model. So you can see it, the model's the model's working quite well for about eight, eight species. Um, some of the rare species, as you'd expect, um, uh, don't perform as well. And then on the right hand side here, we have um, what, envir what environmental factors are driving the, the explained variance. And I guess the take home message here is as expected, depth is important, but we're also seeing a year effect, uh, sea surface temperature, SAM and SSH uh, regularly coming out as explaining prevalence. And this is the abundance, um, the abundance model, very similar patterns. Um, it seems to perform um, explaining it can explain a lot more of the abundance conditional of presence um, for a lot more species uh, we can produce these what we what i'm calling what are called beta plots so we have uh, the list of species again on the left hand side and then along the bottom all the environmental variables it looks a bit like a qr plot but basically the red squares represent a significant positive response to that variable and a blue represents a significant negative response and the take home message from this plot is that in this year column on the far right, it's all red. So this is saying that the prevalence of, it, of these species has actually increased um, through time. And then we're getting a range of different environmental responses, um, but there's a lot of significant results for SAM and SST and SSH. And as expected, depth is, is pretty important for most species. Less significant results for the abundance model, but once again, take home message is that it's all red boxes in the um, year column. There's eight species that have, ex have had a significant increase in abundance um, through time. And then one of the, the really interesting things about this HMSC approach is that we can look at the species species interaction. So um, this is a, so same again, the, the red squares represent a significant positive response between species A on the left hand side and species B on the bottom hand side. And you can see that, and that, so this is the, the a positive or negative response uh, correlation between those species that isn't explained um, by uh, the environmental variables. And then we can also predict across the environmental variables. So here we have six, I've just randomly chosen six species of interest. So uh, I've got toothfish, mackerel fish, grey rock cotton, uh, three of the, the ray species. And as you can see, um, uh, toothfish appeared to be everywhere and pretty consistently through time. But interestingly, um, species such as the rays and the grey rock cotton, even with mackerel ice fish, we're seeing this um, increase through time. And this is another example, this time with sea surface temperature. So you can see for, once again, ice, um, toothfish is fairly consistent um, across all temperatures, but with um, a slow, increasing sea surface temperature, we're seeing an increasing prevalence in these, in these rays. Then we can do things such as predicting across space and time using this predict, predictive maps. So I've pumped off may be able to create 560 maps for every species for 16 years and we can create these animations so this is for species richness so you can see through time that we're predicting species richness has actually increased through time across the plateau so in conclusion, uh, many species, uh, many of the species um, recorded in the RSTS data have actually increased in prevalence and abundance, including species richness. Uh, our model started at 2003, which as you heard through um, at, in Nicole's talk, this coincides with the change from what was a trawl dominated fishery to a long line um, dominated fishery. So I'm um, hypothesizing that this has actually allowed some of the these demersal species such as rays to increase in prevalence and abundance. But we're also seeing some response in the environmental variables such as a SAM and SST and SSH. So it's very hard to disentangle between what is a fisheries related response and what is an environmental related response. So possible explanations are uh, this is due to a reduction of illegal of, of illegal fishing, a change from a trawl to a long line dominated fisheries, or it could simply be that many of these species do actually prefer or are doing better in warming waters. And the, the, the final take home message is that how important long term monitoring data is to being able to make these predictions. So. Um, yeah, long term, as we probably preaching to the choir here, but long term monitoring data is important. 
So what's next? Um, the next stage is to include traits into this HMSC model. So you can include things like life history traits, such as maximum length, trophic level, um, bait behavior, uh, fisheries related metrics, such as whether it's targeted or bycatch, and look at how that correlates to environmental across, across the environment through space and time. I'm also creating a shiny app or a data dashboard that can be used by um, the stakeholders. So you can select the model, the species, and then use the slider to look at how species have changed through time across the Australian EEZ. And then we're going to repeat the process using uh, the continuous plankton recorder to look at how plankton have, have changed in, in prevalence and abundance in the Southern Ocean. So I'll leave it at that. If that, that was a lot of information in eight minutes. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or reach out through Twitter or ask a question now. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joel. Um, just a reminder for folks, you can put your questions into the chat box, into the Q&A box rather, that's already been happening. Um, and the speakers can text that in live and everybody can, can see those answers. Um, so Joel, we actually have a question for you, but given uh, timing and that there's no questions in the Q&A box right now, we might yep. save it for the discussion section. And so everybody can also sure. think about if there are other questions for you um, to pose them at that point. So. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, and I'm going to once again pass off to Christopher to introduce the next speaker. All right, thank you very much, Jilda. And um, thanks, Joel, that was, that was excellent. Um, so the next um, talk coming up is from uh, Matt Pinkerton. I just need to first of all confirm that he's with us because I know he had to go and there he is, awesome. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so Matt's up next and he's going to be uh, presenting um, uh, unraveling the effects of bycatch mortality, predation release, and environmental change on recurrence and ice fish in the Ross Sea. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Matt. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Can you, can you see that? Yeah, looks good. Great. Thanks, Thanks very much. I'm going to talk about um, some work that we've been doing in the Ross Sea region um, of the Southern Ocean. Um, it's been mentioned before, Jill did a great introduction to uh, toothfish in the, in the Southern Ocean, the toothfish fisheries. Um, this is the toothfish fishery in the Ross Sea region, um, which is one of the um, largest toothfish fisheries in the Southern Ocean. Um, so shown here is, is um, the species. Um, thanks very much, Chris, for the photo um, on, the, on there. And also this, the, uh, this panel down in the bottom corner is the catch showing how that kind of ramped up from 1997 when the fishery there started uh, and has been kind of capped at about 3,000 tons a year um, since about 2000. And this is how the biomass of toothfish has gone. So from 100% in 1997, we're now at about 63% spawning stock level. And that's coming down to about 50% um, with constant catch in the future, according to as per Camelot rules. It's a really contentious fishery, as people might know. Um, this is the last ocean campaign that points out that, that this is probably not a good place to start uh, a commercial fishery. It's one of the sort of most valuable, least modified shelf ecosystems in the world with a, a whole set of top predators, got a lot of penguins in there. It's a pretty rich ecosystem. On, on the other side, the fishery in the Ross Sea has been certified sustainable by a couple of organizations and is certainly, you know, one of the best managed fisheries in the world uh, on a relative scale. Now, it's managed according to the principles of uh, Camelot, and which basically has three principles according to rational use. One is to ensure uh, stable recruitment of the, of the toothfish population itself. Second, to maintain ecological relationships. And the third, uh, to make sure the changes are reversible over two to three decades. So really, this talk is going to be around that second one, really. Are we sure that the way that the fishery is being managed in the Ross Sea is maintaining ecological relationships in that region? So this is a food web model we built at the area, and, and toothfish is right at the top. So trophy level on the y-axis here. Uh, toothfish is probably at the top in terms of trophy level of predators in the Ross Sea system. And its prey is made up mainly of uh, large um, demersal fish living in the Ross Sea. So macrurids, ice fish, there's some deep sea cods and some eel, uh, eel cods in that area as well. And skates in that box are um, one of the species which is not eaten by toothfish, but which is also present of that size in the area. 
So when the fishery started, and for a number of years after that, until 2008, actually, with the IPY voyage to the Ross Sea, um, the, the McCrurid, the grenadier, which was found and taken as bycatch in the fishery and found in the stomachs of toothfish, was considered to be one species, Whitson's grenadier. And then uh, we discovered a cryptic species uh, called McCrurid's camel, um, which differs subtly from that, uh, from Whitson's grenadier, in that it's got different numbers of teeth, um, it's got a slightly different colour, um, and it's got a different number of pelvic fin rays. So that new species means that there's now um, two species of McCrurids, which are commonly eaten by toothfish and caught as bycatch in the, in the fishery. So the risk that we identified is whether fishing will destabilize that demersal fish community. So because toothfish um, is basically unparalleled as a fish predator in the region and takes a large portion of the productivity of these prey species, uh, when you fish toothfish, what you expect to see is some kind of trophic cascade or predation release on those prey species. So you expect to see their numbers to increase when that predation pressure is removed. Um, and some of the risk factors for a strong trophic cascade are present in that Rossi system. Um, we don't know whether that's actually going to happen. That's what's predicted. Um, and we also know that those species that are that are likely to undergo that predation release have very different characteristics. They have different um, sizes, different growth rates, different ages and maturity. So the question is whether one of those species is going to be dominant. And if there is a predation release and it increases, whether it will then start to exclude the subordinate competitors in that system. So that's what I mean by destabilization of that fish community. Um, so we've been picking away at that problem. There's a lot of different components that you need. First of all, there's uh, going through the stomachs of toothfish, trying to work out what they eat. And, and to try and identify those down to species is quite difficult. So we've been looking at the otoliths that are found in uh, the two species, Mercurus, um, and found that they kind of have very characteristically different shapes. And so by looking at the characteristics of those otoliths, we can identify the species, and that will ultimately give us a way of um, working out how much of the two species, uh, the relative amounts of those two species eaten by toothfish. Um, we've also been doing analysis of the bycatch rates, which gives us an indication of variability um, of those uh, species over space and over time. So we've been using this, the VAST system, the Vector Autoaggressive Spatial Temporal Models, which separates out the variability that you see in the catch rate into environmental covariates, a year effect, spatial variation, the spatial temporal covariation and vessel effects. And from that, we're not seeing big increases in the relative abundance of, the, uh, of either of those McCrurid species. In fact, camel seems to be decreasing slightly and Whitson I seems to be relatively constant for now. Um, we've also been looking at methods for actually getting an estimate of the total abundance of the two species. One is by doing troll surveys from Tangaroa on the slope. Uh, in stratified areas so that we can try and estimate from those catch rates what the absolute biomass of the McCrurids and the ice fish are. And it also turns out that because McCrurids have got a swim bladder, you can identify them in fisheries acoustics as individual targets. And that gives us a way of directly counting the fish. Um, toothfish are not the same everywhere. They move, uh, as Gilda uh, pointed out. Um, they, they start off as small fish on the shelf. They mature. Um, on the slope area where the majority of the population is. And then as they get bigger and, and become mature, they move out to the sea mounts to the north where they spawn. So understanding how those spatial uh, age related patterns of toothfish are um, means that we can then specify what kind of predation we're expecting from toothfish on those prey species because that's size dependent. And also as the fishery changes the abundance of toothfish, how that will vary in the future. So these are some of the spatially explicit population models for Antarctic toothfish um, projected backwards, time cast back into before the fishery started and in the present day. You can also do this into the future to look at how those patterns are going to change. So then it becomes my job to try and fit all these different pieces together into a multi-species model. And there's no answers here. It's a work in progress. But basically, we've got an individual based model for those bycatch species. Um, we run that so that it's stable and then we project. Um, from the um, unfished level through the air, through the time where we had fishing information to see whether it reproduces the patterns we're seeing to date. And then we can project into the future with that to see how things are likely to change in the future. This is kind of how the model is, and it's got it's it's 
it's got lots, it's very data hungry. It's got lots of inputs from all different kinds of work that I've talked about. Um, and we're still, you know, fitting together those pieces to kind of make that model give us something that we think is sensible. So I'll just leave it there. Essentially, you know, we think it's a well-managed fishery, but there are certainly uh, significant risks um, that we can't quantify at the moment, especially around this prey community. Um, and they'll co-occur with environmental effects. Trying to get the environmental factors on these relationships is also going to be important. And then we will get to the point where we can um, say something sensible or useful about whether the management is precautionary and also whether the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area is doing what it should do in the region in reducing that risk. Uh, I'll leave you there. Thanks very much. Awesome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, if there are any questions on this, um, please pop them in the, uh, uh, the Q&A box. Otherwise, we can take them at the end. Um, and we can go back through each of these talks um, to give you an opportunity to develop questions um, based on that. Okay. All righty. So um, why don't we then move on? Um, thank you very much for that, Matt. The next uh, the next speaker is uh, David Green, um, and he's going to be uh, speaking to uh, modeling Antarctic krill circumpolar spawning habitat quality to identify regions with potential uh, to support high larval production. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to David. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, Can you see my screen? Um, not yet. Ah. Uh, let me see. Let's get this up, guy. Anything yet? It, it says double click to enter full screen mode. It says David Green started screen sharing, double click to enter full screen mode. Oops. There we go. That looks good. Hi, uh, my screen froze up. I'm not sure if people can hear me now. Um, I can hear you, Christopher. I think we just lost David, um, but hopefully right, he'll so, be back. Yeah, well, why don't we just give him a minute to see whether or not um, he can bring it. Okay, he's uh, back. There he is. Okay. Uh, All right, we lost you there for a minute. Apologies. Um, and that's quite all right. We have... lost you for a minute. Um, <laughs> go ahead and, uh, and give it another go. I will do that. It looks like my... Um, uh, is that sharing again? Sorry. All right. Okay. Okay, there we are. Okay, sorry about that. My internet connection no has been a bit no flaky, but um, I should be fine now. So, um, hi again, everyone. I'm not sure what you heard before I disappeared, but um, I'll be talking about some of the the work I did during my PhD. Um, a big component of that was was developing a model that uh, represents the spatial dynamics of Antarctic krill. Um, but today, I'm just going to be speaking about one component of that, which is focused on identifying uh, potential krill spawning habitat. So just uh, and now my slides not working. 
There we go. Um, so, I mean, I guess we're all aware of this, but Antarctic krill um, are really important for the Southern Ocean ecosystems. They, they play, they, they're a key trophic link uh, within Southern Ocean food webs. And they also support huge numbers of higher marine predators as well as other mid-trophic organisms. And, and they're also obviously the target of, of a, a quite a large and expanding fishery. And there's an ever-growing possibility of competition with, uh, with krill-dependent predators. And so we need to have ways to better project the effects that krill fishing could have on surrounding ecosystems. And one of the major concerns that we have at the moment is that we don't really have a good idea of where the biomass of different krill populations um, is sourced from. Um, because krill are largely planktonic, particularly during their early life, um, their distribution is then strongly influenced by ocean circulation. And this means that um, some of the krill populations might depend on imported recruits from upstream uh, spawning areas. And so heavy fishing in some of these spawning areas could ultimately have downstream impacts on, on ecosystems. Um, so as I said, one of the components of my PhD was to try identify regions that could constitute good spawning habitat. And, um, and so to do this, we came up with a spawning habitat model to map uh, potential spawning habitat and, and uh, scale the suitability of, of habitat for krill to spawn and ultimately to produce um, larvae. So just as a quick overview of what I'll talk about, first I'll step through the mechanistic spawning habitat model that we developed um, and then, uh, then, then talk you through how we used the output from the model to to map regions that potentially support high quality spawning habitat. And then I'll speak a bit about the potential implications of our um, map distribution of spawning habitat by matching it with, with the current Camelot spatial management regions, um, with obviously those regions aimed at spreading out krill catch to reduce risk for dependent ecosystems. So this is just a schematic of the, the mechanistic model that we used. Um, it essentially considers three deterministic suitability functions. The, the first two, the, so the one in the left and in the middle, those are uh, they scale temperature and food availability. Um, so essentially they scale the suitability of habitat for mature females to produce eggs over an eight week period leading up to spawning. And then the third function uh, scales the suitability of habitat for the survival of the spawned eggs and young larvae, uh, given that given that they would experience a lot of predation pressure from uh, micronecton species. Um, then uh, ultimately the spawning habitat was calculated as as the product of these three functions to give us a value between zero and one. Um, so then uh, we optimized this model based off of um, an observational map um, of habitat quality, which we derived from work by um, Frankie Perry and Uh, yeah, I think you might have frozen up again, David. So you might want to give it another go. Pick up where you left off on uh, on this slide. All right, we'll start back up here in a minute. I'm I'm sure he's uh, cranking it back up. Never be overconfident about your Zoom skills, and this will happen <laughs> to you too. <laughs> David tested his screen share. Oh, everything works great. Oh, I've uh -huh. done this so many <laughs> times. <laughs> Okay, there's David back in, and um, hello. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm so back I again. <laughs> where um, where did I leave off? 
uh, I think it was like the third slide, maybe. Okay. Let me um, bring that back up. Just a second. Was it about there? Uh, I don't know. No, go back okay. one. Okay. All right. Uh, before this, or? Yeah, I think one more back. Uh, all right. That's no good. Oh, well, that's my first slide. Okay, yeah, go go ahead yeah. after the second one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So essentially, um, one more. I was putting together. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yes. So yeah. So so we're putting together this um, spawning habitat model uh, to scale spawning habitat. I had um, essentially three deterministic suitability functions, which we took the product of to create a, a metric of suitability um, of spawning habitat. So the first two functions were to scale temperature and food availability. And then the third function was to scale uh, essentially the suitability of the habitat based on predation. Um, and then we optimize this model against um, observed distributions of krill that we derived from the literature, and then um, ultimately then use this to the, the model once optimized to scale up to give circumpolar estimates of the distribution of krill. And so uh, the first bit that I'll talk about is that top panel there, and essentially just to show that um, the model represented or well, reflected the seasonal cycle that we'd expect the krill spawning habitat to give with with high quality spawning habitat over the austral summer and negligible habitat over winter which was a relief that it was working um and then after that um then i'll talk a bit about the lower panel which was then pulling out um regions of optimal spawning habitat, which we defined as regions uh, or, or areas that had spawning habitat higher than the 80th percentile for um, three months or more, uh, essentially areas that had high quality spawning habitat for, for a long time each year. Um, and so those really high quality spawning habitats are those that are represented in the orange polygon, dark orange polygons over there. Um, and so then if we um, zoom in to, uh, let's see, into that area over there, um, we see that regions with the greatest potential to support high level production are located in the South Wick, and then they stretch from the Tardif Peninsula as far north as uh, South Georgia, as well as coastal regions stretching along the Antarctic margin in the Pacific. Um, and this is broadly where um, this broadly matches where we find the highest krill biomasses. Uh, it's also worth noting here that just because the region is predicted by the model to have good uh, or support high level production, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it would support a self-sustaining population. And that's because uh, for that to be true, there would have to be a mature uh, adult krill around to actually spawn the krill. And also um, regions that have potentially high production might not support a self-sustaining population because of low survival of krill at different at, at later life stages in the life cycle. So for example, if we look at the region around South Georgia, it looks like there should be a really good spawning habitat there, but uh, the population is not believed to be self-sustaining. And this is probably because conditions ultimately aren't suitable for recruitment or recruits get um, ejected uh, out of the system or out away from South Georgia. Um, so we also wanted to test how well uh, our spawning habitat metric worked in terms of matching population trends. And so to do this, we pull out the mean annual spawning habitat quality for midsummer 
in Camelot, South Area 48.1, and we fitted this against observed krill for the following season around um, northern Antarctic Peninsula. And the results from this produced a pretty good map suggesting that uh, spawning habitat does a reasonable job of approximating recruitment, at least in, in regions that we know can support self-sustaining populations of krill. So then, uh, yeah, so then after that, uh, we also looked at how our map spawning habitat compared with Camelot's existing spatial management framework for the Southern Ocean. And overall, we identified about 2 million square kilometers of optimal spawning habitat. Um, of this, almost half of it occurred within the key Camelot sub areas, spanning the Western Antarctic Peninsula to the Eastern Weddell Sea. Uh, so that's that area in blue. Uh, another 35% roughly was within the sub areas between the Ross and Bellinghausen, Bellingshausen seas, uh, a bit shaded in orange over there. And then the remaining half of the Southern Ocean only accounted for about 20 of the total optimal spawning habitat. Um, and then we zoomed in a little bit on uh, the Southwest Atlantic sector. And, and here we were looking at how much of the optimal spawning habitat within a given sub area was actually covered by a small scale or well, by a small scale management units, which are those outlined in green there. And um, we did this because these small scale management units are important because they, they contain most of the krill catch and they're managed with the intention of spreading risk associated with, with fishing. And what we found is that um, SSMUs contain 76% of optimal spawning habitat within the Antarctic Peninsula subarea, and 35% uh, of the optimal spawning habitat within the South Georgia subareas. But in the South Orkney and South Sandwich uh, subareas, the SSMUs only captured about 68% of the optimal spawning habitat, um, suggesting that these fish populations here might actually rely on imported recruits from upstream. Um, the SSMUs around the Antarctic Peninsula also really stand out because of their high representation of optimal spawning habitat, as well as their upstream positioning from the other sub areas and small scale management units. Um, so krill around the Antarctic Peninsula could well be a valuable source for other population. And this is important investment of fishing um, effort that's focused around this particular area. Uh, so to conclude, these findings raise quite important implications for the small scale management of the krill fishery and highlight that there could be potential downstream consequences from catches, particularly around the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me on email or uh, Twitter or, um, or, yeah, or in, in the discussion later. Um, thanks very much. Okay, thank you so much, David. That was that was excellent. Um, and yeah, as as David mentioned, if there are questions, they can be popped into the Q and A now, or we can uh, pick them up in just a few minutes um, when we get into the sort of the broader discussion. Or we'll probably end up going back through each of the papers just to find out uh, to ensure that there weren't specific questions and not uh, anything of a more broad nature. Um, now that being said, um, I will now pass it back over to Jilda, and we may or may not have Francisco's correct uh, presentation now. And um, yeah, so Jilda. Uh, yeah, um, so IT team, thank you so much for your discussions on the side. Let's try to play his second video and see if it is different from the first one, if it actually is the trophodynamics talk. Um, so let's okay. maybe, yeah, just to be quicker, start yeah. playing that. Okay. If it's the same talk, we'll stop. Okay, one by one, I will play both the videos. Let me know which is the correct one to play right now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, this is the, the good video that was mentioned. Hello, this everyone. Section. My name is Francisco Santa Cruz. I'm going to talk about the trophodynamics of the Antarctic toothfish in the Antarctic Peninsula. Pre-composition of fatty acid. Video? 
This work is part of a collaboration between This is the correct video. You can let it play. Thank Columbus you. University Católica de Chile, the Chilean Antarctic Institute, the Universidad de Magallanes, and the Institute of Fisheries and Marine Ecology of Ukraine. The Antarctic toothfish is an ototenid species endemic of the Southern Ocean. It lives uh, from the sea surface up to 3,000 meters and can length up to two meters, weighs up to 100 kilograms and lives up to 30 years. This species is a highly valuable fishing resource, which all the fishing activities are regulated and managed by the Commission for the Conservation of the Antarctic Marine Living Resource, CAMELAR, which applied a, a stock assessment approach to estimate precautionary catch limit among different fishing grounds, and also use an ecosystem-based management for conservation of these species. Uh, regarding the biology of Antarctic toothfish, it's considered like a top predator in both the benthic and pelagic ecosystem. In general, it has a strategy based of opportunistic feeding, where uh, the diet composition could vary varied uh, depending on the spatial distribution, vertical distribution, and of, uh, ontogenetic change of through the life history of Antarctic toothfish. In general, all the knowledge of this species uh, has been historically uh, related to the fishing uh, dependent data. Uh, in, this in this case, uh, the the fishing occurred mostly in the Ross Sea, in the East Antarctica, Weddell Sea, and other places. But uh, there is an important gap in the biological and ecological information in the Antarctic Peninsula, because here uh, the direct fishing is banned, and just some exploratory fishing in, uh, within research block is allowed. So the objective of this study is to describe the feeding strategy uh, of the Antarctic toothfish in the in the Antarctic Peninsula by coupling morphological identification and by a chemical analysis of the prey. We use sample from the Ukrainian fishing vessel Calypso, uh, which operate uh, in February 2020 and February 2021 in, in two research blocks in the tip of, of Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, they use a Spanish bottom long line, a different deep stratas, and all the information, the biological information was recorded. Uh, and the, the stomach were stored and frozen in, at minus, minus 20 degrees. Uh, all the samples were sent to the INACH laboratory in Punta um, To describe the, the, the prey on the dye composition, and the stomach content, we used two approach. Uh, one was uh, separate all the prey and identify morpholo morphologically. And also we take some tissue, muscle tissue, to conduct a, a fatty acid profile analysis. In, ter in terms of the diet composition, we use the common uh, feeding index like occurrence, mass contribution, numerical contribution. And we calculate the index, index of relative importance. This was calculated by size classes to detect some ontogenetic variability, by sex, band, and by year. We use Permanova to test uh, statistical variability. Yes. And for fatty acid analysis, the muscle tissues was analyzed, anal analyzed through methyl esters frames uh, methodology. Uh, we identified all the composition in terms of the fatty acid uh, profiles. And we used some permanova to detect difference between composition of fatty acid among prey. And also you, you, we use non-metric multidimensional scaling or nature to to illustrate uh, this variability. And we use SIMPER to detect, identify the fatty acid contribution and the level of dissimilarity. Uh, in terms of the results, we identify different prey items, different taxes, 
from anthozoa, crustacea, mollusks, and fishes uh, and birds. Um, in, in general, the most important prey item was macrourie, macrourus calm, macrourus guizzoni, also, also chanictidae and autopteridae. And uh, secondarily, one important prey item was cephalopods. Uh, we uh, calculate or detect uh, significant uh, differences between years, but no difference between sex um, or between size classes. Uh, in terms of the fatty acid composition, we detect two main groups, one compo composed by fishes, the group one, composed, composed by, ma by macrourid, chanictidae, and anodopteridae. Uh, and the group two uh, composed mostly for cephalopods. Uh, this, uh, in general, the, the fatty acid composition was based on 28 uh, identified fatty acids. Uh, comparatively, uh, we identified that in group one of features was uh, the most important fatty acid was palmitoleic and oleic fatty acids. And for the group two of cephalobots, uh, the most important was acopentasanoic and do docosaxexanoic fatty acids. Also, we estimate different uh, amounts of total triacylglycerides in was more higher in, in macrouri than, than cephalobots. Um, these uh, are one of the most of, of data. I'm pretty sure the, the first characterization of the diet of the Disostigum ausoni in the Antarctic Peninsula, at least in, in the last uh, two decades. Uh, Mac Macruridae was the most important prey item, but which is similar to what has been reported in other sectors in Antarctica. Um, secondarily, the, the, diet, the diet was composed by cephalopods, same sim uh, similar situation in, in, in different parts of Antarctica. And Chanictidae was also an important prey, uh, but we only we are able to identify uh, one species. Keonobatiscus de Witty, uh, probably among the highly digested uh, prey, there were other species. So it will be important for future analysis to use um, molecular approaches. Uh, we just uh, identified one nototenin species, Lepidonototenes honeyfrom, which is very uh, Different uh, because the commonly the notodenida the very common species the prey species in Antarctic too, which feeding. <clears throat> uh, this is probably uh, related uh, uh, potentially to an uh, internal variability of this uh, family uh, because in the in the bycatch, uh, nototenis was also very low in season 2021. Um, so uh, we confirm that Antarctic toothfish is an opportunistic and generalist predator that probably feeds on the most abundant prey items uh, in, the, in the environment. Uh, no difference was found among science class, uh, but we the the smallest individual that we anal analyzed was where was 18 centimeters. So probably if we can extend to a, a smaller size, we can obtain more determinant results. Uh, our results confirm the top predator role of Antarctic toothfish and therefore highlight the potential impact. Uh, in the benthic and pelagic ecosystem in the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, especially in the in its potential role uh, as a controller uh, on macrouri and other fish uh, population through a trophic ca cascade events, and we so our results support the high importance of Antarctic toothfish for for those ecosystems. 
And uh, of course, uh, we encourage and recognize that it's important to maintain a precautionary approach in the exploitation of this resource and use this kind of information to this new information for the ecological and ecosystem-based management of, of these species. Uh, I would like to thanks to the Marine Protected Area of the Chilean Antarctic Institute and the Ukrainian colleagues and the crew of the Fitch and Versus Calypso for the samples. And any comments of observation and doubts, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much for your attention. So that was the talk from Francisco that we wanted to look at earlier. Um, I'm going to pop once again his email into the chat if anyone has any questions for him on either of the talks that we saw today. Um, and we're at 37 minutes past the hour. We've got 23 minutes until our session block is over, although we have some flexibility at the end of that. And the idea now is to have our discussion section, have things be a bit more dynamic, come back to some questions that uh, were had for different speakers. And so in order to do that um, in a way that's a bit easier than the webinar format, we're gonna go ahead and promote everyone that's in the attendee list now to panelists. And you will have the opportunity then to raise your hand, to put things in the chat box. Um, we do ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking, but feel free to turn on your video at that point. Um, and so we can, be a bit more dynamic. So um, I'm going to start doing that. And as I'm doing that, I'm going to um, pose my first question going back to, and also I'll ask the, the panelists and the speakers uh, to also feel free to turn on your videos because we're going to now be asking you some questions. And I'm going to go back to Nicole um, with the first talk um, and pose the following question. Um, and also, folks from the audience that have thoughts on this, once you're promoted, which I'm gonna do in a second, feel free to also give your thoughts. But my question was, what are some confounding factors that you think might be important when using catch data as a proxy for fish distributions? Oh, not a small question there. <laughs> um, well, there can be lots of, there can be a few things. One of which is um, where they actually fish. Um, and for that, we put, you know, that's why we specifically included Latin longs in, in the model to try and account for some of that. And the fact that the fishery has expanded through time. But I did look at um, some of the preliminary, in, in the preliminary analyses, I did look at the relationships between, you know, the environmental variables and the expanding fishery and found that it didn't actually, there weren't many, many correlations in that respect. So you know, trying to understand where the confounding could be within the model. Well, thanks for that. And um, I was actually, we, the, some of the folks at Avi that I mentioned to you actually joined on the session, uh, Becky Conenberg, um, yep. who's working Hi, on Becky. this. Um, yeah, um, so I'm trying to get her in as a panelist. It's also quite early for her. So I, I feel bad that she wasn't here in the beginning, but it was 5 a.m. So I can understand that. Um, so actually, if Becky, you had anything that you wanted to add to that because you're gonna, you're using um, similar data. Um, also, if any of the other speakers have anything to add to this uh, question, I should also I should also add that. So I just I presented the commercial data, but we also have, um, like Joel presented, the random stratified soil trawl data, which is scientific survey data, and we've also been looking at that. But that obviously captures a different component um, of the of the fish uh, life history um, to the to the long line component. Okay, so I think it takes a bit of a, a short second for folks to be promoted to panelists. I think they have to click yes. Um, so while we're waiting for um, people to, and also not everyone needs to promote to panelists, people can decline that as well. So feel free to do so if I've promoted you and you don't want to do that. Um, but so in the meantime, I might actually pass over um, to you, Christopher, to come to some other of the questions that we had for the speakers while I focus on bringing the attendees into the, the panelist section. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, Chelda, I actually had a, a question about your talk, but I'll, I'll put that aside for now. Um, I would like to ask uh, perhaps uh, Matt a question. Um, 
first of all, I want to congratulate you on all this work, all these initiatives that have been taking place um, to, to look at the bycatch in the Ross Sea. Um, I think it's all really valuable steps you're taking. Um, and one of the things that I've always thought would be really useful would be identifying and mapping these sort of bycatch hotspots, uh, which you've done a little bit of that um, in your talk around the Ross Sea, um, so that vessels that are setting lines in these areas might, um, might know that they're likely going to run into a lot of bycatch uh, in the area. Um, so one of the one of the stipulations in the conservation measure for the Ross Sea toothfish fishery is, is there's a rule uh, by where if the bycatch in any one species is uh, equal to or greater than a ton in any haul or set, then you have to, um, then the fish, then the vessel has to move five miles. Um, and I'm wondering if you've had an opportunity to look at, um, at where specifically these move on rules have been triggered and, uh, and whether or not they, sort of match up well with what you're seeing in terms of the uh, uh, um, uh, rat tail bycatch in that area. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, there's definitely those, those move on rules do get triggered, but quite rarely. So there's, there's areas where, you know, the fishers know where the bycatch is going to be high and they tend to avoid those spots just because um, operationally it's a real pain to catch too much bycatch. They've got a because as you know, no uh, bycatch is allowed to be put back over the side in the in the Southern Ocean. So any bycatch that they do get has to be stored on board and then taken out of the area. So that's the kind of operational pain for them. So generally the vessels try and avoid areas that they know have high bycatch. And they and they are aware of where those areas are. So there's you know characteristic areas where the bycatch, particularly of McCrew is is high. Um, you know, the eastern side of the Iceland Bank is one of those. And so um, the bycat, the move on rules rarely get triggered because I think the vessels kind of avoid those before it gets to that level. But they do get triggered and they do correspond to where the modeling puts those hotspots. So in the in the vast modeling that we've done now, one of the one of the outputs of that is to identify those kind of hotspot areas. Um, and and we can you know you can use those to then um, if you want to do something in advance and and say you know give that information to the fishery and say these areas are likely to have high bycatch maybe you should avoid those rather than it triggering a move on rule that that can happen so um, so yes the, the, it tends to be quite static is my understanding so those those areas of hotspot don't move around a lot from year to year. They tend to be in particular areas, which kind of might make them easier to manage. Okay, thanks. I was just gonna make a comment to your earlier question, Gilda, as well about, or the, the question about whether it's, you know, what's the problem of using fisheries data for doing this kind of ecological investigation, especially if you're kind of fitting, um, trying to look at environmental dependence of species, you know, using fisheries data for that can be problematic because obviously the sampling is not random. So if the if it's a target, if the species that you're trying to model is a target of the fishery, you're only going to get information where that species is present, not where it's absent. With the bycatch, it's not quite so bad because that's not what they're controlling on. So it's a more randomized survey. So it tends to work well um, or better anyway. I think one of the important things you can do is when you do do the fitting to the environmental data, you've got to look at the environmental conditions and the data that you got the training data. So that's where the fishery was operating and then compare that to the area where you're trying to project into. So if you're trying to project into an area which has got different environmental characteristics from where all your training data was, then it's far more unreliable. So you can you can look at that sort of multivariate environmental space and say, we have information in this environmental space, but not in this environmental space. Therefore, we're not going to project into this unknown space. And uh, we've done that for some other um, species environment modeling, which masks out those areas where you think them, the projection is likely to be untenable. You can also, you know, you can even do that up to the point of where you say, you know, these are depth limits on where we think the distribution of the fish are and just mask out areas that are shallower or deeper. That's a little bit crude, but can work sometimes as well. So I wanted to say thank you for that addition, because in fact, that was, I think, more of the, the direction of my question, because I think 
we're working with the data that we have. It's the best available science, not the best science. <laughs> um, so I, I think my question was more along the lines of, yes, there are all these issues, but how can we deal with them? And so this discussion of, of the training sets and the masking, I think, leads towards how we can deal with the biases and the type of data that we're using for these types of environmental associations. Yeah, I mean, you can you can even play games where you kind of sprinkle pseudo absences around um, and, and then fit those. It, it starts to get a little bit more um, tenuous, though, I think that. But that's that's another method that's been used to try and give you absences in areas where the fishery hasn't visited. But yeah, we've got to you've got to work with what we've got, right? Exactly. That's interesting. Um. If I could ask a, another question um, for David um, on the on the krill spawning habitat um, presentation, um, first of all, I think the the small scale management areas um, are looking at the evaluating the small scale management areas for good spawning habitats really worthwhile, and uh, and that's that's a welcome contribution. And your contention regarding the the krill being imported um, to other areas um, is is very sound. Um, I, I just want to note there's been a lot of speculation over the years about um, the Wood LC also contributing to to krill in regions downstream towards the Scotia Sea. And I wonder if you have um, an idea about how to model um, and whether the Wood LC also has um, good quality spawning habitats. Uh, perhaps those areas along the uh, eastern side of the peninsula or or further south, and if you've thought about that. Uh, yeah, definitely. That's, that's a great question. Um, and, and certainly they've, uh, some of our, uh, our colleagues have been doing um, those very uh, studies, looking at particle tracking and things around uh, the Western Weddell Sea and things. Um, this, in terms of what I'm doing, I'm I'm actually trying to now implement a, a full population model on krill, um, which I didn't have time to get into today. But um, that has it's it's um, a modified version of uh, CPDIM. I'm not sure if you've come across CPDIM, but it's uh, it was developed for the tuna fishery in the Pacific, um, and and it's it's got spatial processes embedded in it. So ultimately. We'd be feeding the spawning habitat into that, and then um, with with the full krill life history in, involved, we can start seeing where these spawning areas uh, ultimately, which ones are good and which ones aren't, and and where the krill end up. Um, so that would hopefully get us towards understanding that better. Okay, is there anything from the floor um, that anyone would like to ask any of the speakers um, from the presentations that we had earlier? And also, if you're still in the att attendees section or you prefer to stay there, you can always still use the Q&A box and we'll see that. All right, well, Jilda, I was going to ask you about one, uh, one or two things from your presentation on the whole genome um, resequencing um, to identify the adaptations and genetic structure. And I, I just wondering, have you have you come across um, sort of other genetically informed species distribution models um, for other fin fish species? And has that been successful um, in terms of, you know, especially for those species with very large uh, spatial distributions? Um. So the short answer is no. Um, this is very new stuff. A lot of this, um, I thought about including a couple of slides to talk a bit more about genome environment associations and genetically informed species distribution models, considering that this is not necessarily a genomics group, but in the interest of time, I, I didn't. So apologies if these concepts are a bit out of the blue. Um, but uh, a lot of this work was, especially the genetically informed species distribution models were developed in plants makes sense, they don't move, it's a lot easier to control for environmental things. Um, but there's certainly been um, 
genotype environment association work done in terrestrial species, higher trophic level, level organisms, birds. There's been quite a bit of work in plankton in the marine realm. Um, but to my knowledge, um, I'm not aware of genetically dis informed species distribution models in any marine species, let alone uh, fin fish species. So this is, you know, this is quite new. This is quite experimental, um, you know, We'll see at the end of it what we're actually able to come up with, um, but uh, you know, one has to try. Awesome. We have very high expectations, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, are there are there any other questions? Any anything uh, either from the talks or sort of larger um, sorts of more holistic questions that anyone would like to um, to ask or to generate some discussion? We still have a, a few minutes left. Yeah, so I might, um, while folks are thinking, um, throw out a kind of general discussion point. Um, so a lot of the talks today have touched on the potential impacts from environmental change in the Southern Ocean. Um, you know, and in particular, I'm thinking uh, Joel and Nicole about your talks, but I think a lot of the talks contribute to this. And so I, I guess I was just wondering about your perspectives on what the to fo focus a bit more on the management implications of this. Like how can we actually incorporate the outcome of this work into management? If you have any thoughts on that. So I, I guess with the two fish component, um, you know, the part I presented is just a small part of a, a bigger project that's trying to get you know, a, a better rounded understanding of, of what's going on on the plateau. Um, and another component of the modelling that is happening at the moment is some size spectrum modelling. So sort of running that out into the future and looking at what some of the sort of decadal predictions might look like um, with, with just, you know, holding fishing at its current levels and, and looking at the impacts of um, temperature using, um, you know, size theory, essentially. Um, so, you know, there's aspects of, of that, that those predictions that might be useful for management and also the industry themselves. Um, so part of their interest in this project was, you know, understanding sort of strategically and tactically what some of the responses might be. Um, but there's also the potential um, to, you know, I think it's a bit controversial, but the potential to use some of the information that we're finding on their relationships with environments in, in, in the stock assessment process itself, which is currently, as I understand it, more, um, you know, a little bit removed from the environment, but has the potential to include um, that aspect as well. Can I try follow Into up that, on Nicole? that? Um, yeah, um, Nicole, I know you, I'm sure you've been asked this question, but the work that you're doing um, around Heard Island and looking at the environment, looking at the at some of the um, measures coming from the fishery and, and signals and so forth, are you working as well with uh, sort of the French side of the plateau and seeing whether or not you're getting parallel sort of things going in the same direction or is it just totally different? Uh, we aren't looking at that currently. So um, because of the funding, we focused on the Australian EEZ. Um, but that's also, you know, been a discussion, particularly with, with, with Joel's work, looking at the community more broadly. Um, and we're in discussions or about to start those discussions um, yeah. with Clara. <clears throat> sure. I was also going to touch on the, the management side of things because I probably probably rushed through and, and gl uh, glossed completely over it, but from the joint species um, distribution modeling side of things, um, it also touches on some of the, the work that Matt talked about and Dave talked about. It's all, it's all related in that um, hoping to come up with um, similar sort of thing, bycatch models, so we can look at um, where we're seeing higher concentrations or, or prevalence and abundance of, of bycatch species, particularly species of interest, which um, the Australian Antarctic Division um, has shown interest in some of the, the skates and rays down there. So they have a, a similar move on rule. If they get X number of rays, then they need to move on five miles. So we can start testing if that, if that five miles is far enough, or maybe they need to go 10, 50, 100 miles. Um, there's also the marine park aspect, so because we've got sites inside and outside of the marine park, so to, to test how the marine park is influencing um, um, the benthic fish community from a biodiversity point of view. And yeah, so hopefully we, we have a pretty, we, well, 
the Australian Antarctic Division is a collaborator on the project and hopefully we can get um, get some of this information feeding into the CAMLA process as well. Because like I said before, everything's been so single species focused. Um, and the great thing about this joint species distribution modeling approach is um, you can start to look at some of those rarer species that we've got less biological and ecological information and because it shares it can potentially if there's correlations between species it's, it can share information throughout the model and so it gives you a bit of an ins better insight into the distribution um, through space and time so there's, there's lots of management applications and yeah it's definitely a really important part of this project well, thanks that's, for that that's awesome. yeah, was, I was... might actually add another um answer to my own question at the risk of being weird um based on the the talk not the convener me um and I, it kind of comes back to your point joel about you know changing these numbers that we use so the move on rule is it five is it ten how many miles is it like that's a concrete thing that we can use some sort of data to inform and change and so, I mean, this is all quite highly experimental because it's actually in, in a funding proposal I'm putting together now for the sort of continuation of this work, of this climate genomics work, um, and which is potentially to be working with um, the fisheries management folks here in, in France, here in Paris at the Natural History Museum. You know, uh, Nicole mentioned Clara. So there's obviously um, the, the French fisheries management happens out of this area. And the question in the EZs for France, and the question is, um, um, to what extent could we use information related to local adaptation tendencies or population structuring to modify, you know, the number in the equation to how much how much to dampen the fishing for next year or how much to increase it based on the biomass estimate? You know, can we put in a modifier there based on these types of information? So this is something that, I, again, I'm, I'm not the stock management expert side of things. So there's certainly more for me to learn on that. But the folks here um, at the Paris Natural History Museum do a lot of that work. And I'm hoping to collaborate with them on seeing how the outcomes from my work can perhaps inform, again, changing that number that's ultimately used to then create these, these limits, you know, in, in a tangible way of the work going from the science to the management. just make a, put a, a comment in about the management aspect is in that um, when you look at the sort of dual, the two main pressures, I guess, on the marine environment down in the Southern Ocean of climate change and fishing, you know, what we do is unlikely to change what happens to global climate change. You know, that's that's kind of outside our, our pay scale, I guess. Um, but what's but we can do something about the, the management of the fish rate, you know, that is that should be within our remit, you know, and also Potentially, the effects of fishing are going to happen faster and more suddenly than the effects of climate change in parts of the Antarctic. So I think we you know the, the role of science in kind of managing these environments it should be really strong. And through Camelar, you know, I still have confidence that if, if there is good evidence in Camelar of something breaching those principles of conservation, then Camelar will act as an organization and as a community to address those issues. So I think we we need to to kind of be strong about that science and and really see the opportunities for science to flow through into management in the Southern Ocean. Um, we just have to make sure we do that against this kind of varying backdrop of climate change and all those effects as well, so that the science is strong about what's causing these changes. Couldn't agree more. Okay, thank thank you very much for that. Um, that discussion. Um, yeah, th this sort of leads on to one other quick thing I wanted to bring up, but a lot of the work that's done by the scientists who participate in SCAR and do a lot of uh, a lot of the work on biology and ecology and, and other aspects um, doesn't always get to Camelar. Um, there doesn't seem to be a very sort of smooth exchange of information from what Camelar needs versus sort of what SCAR is seeing. And one of the things I think is, is going to be increasingly important is that we somehow figure out a way to, to increase the flow of information and communication between uh, the scientific committee of Camelar to be able to make decisions like this and, and the work that's coming out, for example, from this session we just had. 
Um, so, I mean, one of the things I, I might recommend is that if you see something happening as a scientist in your specific line of work that rings a bit, that, you know, sort of flashes um, and sounds an alarm and so forth, get in touch with the, um, with the scientific committee representative of your country that goes to Camelot and let them know and get that information into the um, into sort of the Camelot arena for consideration, specifically along with recommendations. Um, so I'd, I'd kind of encourage that um, as best we can. Um, Delta? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree, Chris. I think that's a really good point. And I think Camelot is definitely aware of the fact that expertise in climate change and the effects of climate change on southern ocean ecosystems is kind of has been outside their remit and outside their realm of expertise. And so they're, you know, trying to start um, processes to kind of get more of that information into Camelot and start thinking about how the management of Camelot can be made more robust to the effects of climate change. But I think on the on the, in a similar method. People in, in SCAR need to get more wised up about fisheries and fisheries management and what Camelot are actually making the decisions on so that they can sort of target the advice that they're getting and the research that they're doing to be more useful for Camelot. So it's it's a kind of two way street, I think, in that in that sense. That actually gives a little shining light to me about a potential for a mini symposium or a workshop at the next SCAR conference. I know this conference I'm involved in, the SRP Anticon, did quite a few, did a workshop on science policy, but I think it was a bit more general. It was more Antarctic Treaty System focused, and we can think about perhaps organizing something for the next OSC, which is really CAMLAR focused, and it's not necessarily uh, presentations like what we're doing here, which I think is still important and should continue, but is something that's really focused on bringing biologists or people that are outside of the Camlar sphere, but in the SCAR sphere, more into understanding what Camlar's needs are um, so that we can try to bridge that gap. But I think that's a really cool idea and it's food for thought. Um, so we're arriving at the, the end of the session. We've, we've hit our two hours. Um, I wanted to thank again the speakers, Nicole, Joel, Matt, David, and Francisco in absentia. Um, I think this was really great, really interesting, um, a lot of food for thought. Um, uh, this this is, was all recorded, so there will be this will be posted to YouTube. Um, in I think a week or so, we'll get links about this. If you don't want your talk to be uh, on YouTube because of sensitive data or things are waiting to be published, um, you can contact the conference organizers. Maybe if the IT people can throw that email that you have to send, if you, if you want to opt out of that, they can put that in the chat. And I think also in the emails you received, there was that email as well, but um, so we can get that to you. Um, and of course, there's another iteration of this session taking place, the PM session. Um, I know that won't work for a lot of our colleagues in Oceania, but um, that'll be more of the Americas Europe session. Um, so we hope maybe to see some of you in the attendees there. Um, but uh, many of you may be sleeping, so that's also fine. That will be recorded too, so you can check that out. And also we'll follow up with all the speakers. We might want to put together a Google Drive that we can share with everyone that will have the presentations if you're open to sharing your presentation um, so that that resource is available as well. Um, so I just want to thank again, everyone. Thank Christopher. Um, also Cassandra, who was another uh, very important convener for this. She's gonna be joining me in the PM session to convene. Um, so, and also of course, our wonderful SCAR IT teams um, who have been really supportive um, throughout this process and during the session. So um, thanks again, everyone. Um, I think we'll, we'll close it out. Uh, maybe see some of you in the PM session and we'll be in touch because these conversations don't end here. Thanks a lot, everyone. That was good. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Chris.